is the Vintage RPG Podcast. Your source for the best in classic and contemporary RPGs. With your hosts, Hambone and Stu. Welcome to the Vintage RPG Podcast. Coming at you again from the clubhouse, hidden somewhere in the swamps of New Jersey. I'm John Hambone McGuire, and with me, as always, is the founder and publisher of Unwinnable. He says, Hambone, it's been a very long time since I've been on a bar crawl, and especially long for you, Stu Horvath. <laughs> It's true. The funny thing about what we're talking about today is that it's so sort of delightfully infused with beverage drinking, <laughs> but uh, it doesn't come with a hangover, which is great. Which is optimal. Let's face it. Yeah. And I, you know, I I spent last night trying to write that joke because we recorded last night, we're recording this night. I uh, got to say this uh, to everyone real quick. Next few weeks is loaded with interviews with like some amazing guests. So if you heard the Bloodsport Gambler interview uh, today, we have a very, very, very special guest. W.F. Smith is here. The amazing mind behind Barkeep on the Borderlands. And we are thrilled to chat with you today. So why don't you tell us a little bit about Barkeep on the Borderlands for those listeners who may not be hip to uh, what we're about to lay down on them. Sure. And, and thanks for having me. Um, so I, I am maybe the, the most involved mind, but I am one of many minds behind Barkeep. Um, it is a pub crawl adventure. So if you're familiar with hex crawls and dungeon crawls, the idea is sort of the same, except for instead of being in a dungeon or being you know across a, a fantasy realm, you're inside of a fantasy city and you're going from pub to pub. Um, and there's kind of an overarching narrative involved that you want to engage with it, but it mostly is, is tavern related shenanigans. So many adventures start in the tavern but that's not the adventure here the adventure is in the taverns and when i say there was a lot of minds involved um there are 10 or sorry there are 11 other authors other than me who all wrote their own um taverns such as zedek shu uh, luca rayek ben lawrence chris mcdowell just kind of a, a who's who of the osr blogosphere has has contributed to this and it's a really kind of vibrant and and diverse sort of set of product and a real murderous row of artists as well, because this book is colorful. It's got so much life to it and so much vibe to it. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the artists as well? Because uh, I do notice you got my homie Hodag in there. Uh, Absolutely. I'm pretty excited yeah. to see Hodag. Uh, Sheboygan's favorite son, Hodag RPG. He really is. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, we have more artists than we do writers. So I, it's it's too many really to list, but the um, the cover in a lot of the interior is, is Sam Amell, and he's the Sam Amelli, Skullboy. He's the first artist I had on board and kind of was the the one that I would point other artists to and be like, we're going for kind of this sort of vibe. It really sets the tone in a, in a good way. That cover really grabbed me. And basically the, the, the entire zine kind of like is in uh, that same vibe and it's really good. Yeah, it's, it's very whimsical, kind of very colorful. Um, an interesting thing about that cover is, so it's an homage to the original Keep on the Borderland module, which obviously this is also kind of playing with. Um, and it uses a similar color scheme, the kind of um, the pinks sort of are, are the same colors from the original. And I saw a comment on some other YouTube channel complaining about Barkeep. And they're like, the, the pinks, this must be some type of war on men. It's like, no, it's it's, it's B2. I mean, <laughs> I, I found that so funny. <laughs> Let me tell you something, man. Nothing looks more manly on a man than coral. OK, <laughs> that's a fantastic color for anybody to wear. Oh, I'm a big I'm a big fan of of pastel pinks and purples, um, and and that's kind of my vibe. But one from blog as well as kind of a purples and just good colors. Um, purple's a good color. Yeah, solid. Nothing wrong with purple. Classic man. villain colors: green and purple. Yeah, yeah exactly. a lot of a lot of other artists. Uh, Norn Nasica, Jim Hall did the the cartography. Um, I think we have like we we have so many artists. So we recently we won the the gold any for best supplement. Um, despite it being an adventure. Congratulations. Thanks. Um, we, we I worked hard for it. Um, and I ordered as many medals as I could so I could give them to everybody. And even <laughs> if they just did you know, one piece of spot art, I wanted, you know, you're because it's it's not, you know, best writing or best art direction. It's, it's best supplement. So I think it's the whole product. So everyone on there who wanted a medal is getting a medal. I think there's only two people who are like not worth the shipping for me. But most people are I'm, I'm sending medals all across the <laughs> The world. That's I think amazing. Like, There's yeah. so many medals. It, it, right now, they're all in my living room. It's just a. It's like a pie. It's like a dragon's hoard of of any <laughs> gold medals. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of the most classy things a company could do. 
you know, and, and yeah, you are a, a small mom and pop operation, but still like the fact that clearly a sidebar here that you even recognize and take the time to recognize that, you know, it does take a village to make a book and that, you know, it's not just you up there. You're celebrating everybody who was a part of this project is absolutely amazing. It should be applauded and more companies should do it. More people should get behind it because it's not just, you know, the person at the helm of the ship. It's the, the people working in the engine room as well that get that boat going. So dude, hell yeah, man. Good on you. Oh, well, it was such a collaborative project. I, I, I think that whenever you're, people are reading through it, a lot of it gets kind of missed because you see how things are connecting, but you don't necessarily, you don't know the process of how that happened. And each bar got so many, you know, rewrites, things where like, oh, we could connect this and this. And so even though I wrote 10 of the pubs and I wrote the the rules and kind of the background of the adventure, a lot of that became influenced and infused with the ideas other people were putting out. So you know, where my contributions start and end and where everybody else's does, it's too hard to really say. And, and the credits page don't fully give it its due. So I think we're, all, the, I think the whole team, which is, I think, 30-ish people all told is, are all winners. Um, so everybody gets a medal. <laughs> well, very cool. Let's uh, take it back real quick, though, if you don't mind. Let's yeah. talk about the rules a little bit, because one of my favorite things about this, and it, it's something that really does go wrong at a lot of tables, if historically throughout time and space is people being like, I'm in the pub, I'm getting drunk. And like, there's no real way to quantify that. Uh, you've got a drinking mechanic in this game that is absolutely elegant in its simplicity. And, and I don't say simplicity as a slight. I say that as the highest compliment for having to relate at a table to your players. Tell the people about that because that was something real special. So I have kind of a blog post I wrote while developing where I kind of complain about a lot of the 5e and sort of modern drinking rules, which are mostly like, here's how drinking affects you in combat, which um, if you are a drinker of alcohol, is not usually something you even think about. So I, because <laughs> this is a social adventure, yeah, I don't, I don't drink to, to be better at fighting or worse. And so what I was focusing on in this social adventure was the social impacts of it. Um, so kind of you based on your constitution, you have kind of a starting sobriety die. Um, you roll whenever the event die, kind of a hazard die system tells you to, and it might downgrade, basically representing you getting um, more and more drunk. So you go from kind of sober to tipsy, um, to, to drunk, to blackout drunk. Um, and there's sort of, there's some benefits and some drawbacks to the various middle stages. So, you know, being tipsy, sometimes you do have kind of advantage to your your charisma checks. You're also doing some, some, some rude, you know, burping and stuff. But then once you get drunk, maybe you're not quite as in control of your fac faculties. And blackout is kind of, it's sort of a fail state of the game, um, but not not a total fail state. You're still kind of in control of your character, but every turn there's like a one in six chance. Maybe it's, I think it's a one in six chance of you not controlling your character. And maybe it's the referee or maybe it's another player. Um, and if you ever get separated from the party while you're blackout, that, at that point, we're like, all right, we don't know what happened to your character for the rest of the night. Roll a die on the map. That's where you uh, wake up the next morning. <laughs> you know, whether or not it's even or odd tells you if you were indoors or outdoors, if you were indoors you know, determine who who you were waking up with, maybe a friend, maybe a, a new lover. Um, but so kind of if, you, if you're blackout and you get separated, it's, it's game over, at least for that night. But yeah, the, the drinking rules, um, they're really intended to be something that's a social kind of um, risk and reward because you want to kind of get into that like tipsy social stage, especially for gathering rumors and gathering clues. Um, you don't want to get too drunk. And then you can also, you can choose not to drink at all. The issue is that this adventure takes place during a big festival medieval style festival called the raves of chaos and if you're in a pub during the raves of chaos and you're not drinking people are a little skeptical so it has kind of social implications there even of not drinking you just did it so i, I have to to call it out it's a very punny adventure in a lot of ways and uh i i usually hate puns i used to work at a, a daily newspaper so like puns were just like oh god they're everywhere i really like the puns in <laughs> In barkeep because like they actually genuinely like like tickle something like the raves of chaos like made me like like tear laugh <laughs> like i was just but in addition to the pun you're also making a really strong reference to the keep on the borderlands and, and this is directly connected right yeah it, it's sort of a, a sequel in a way it, it takes place you know 200 100 i think 200 years after the adventure of keeps on the borderland so the the keep has grown into a city the the caves where all the monsters living the caves of chaos have been uh, colonized and the, the monsters have been kind of subsumed into the greater society um, and have kind of formed like an underclass of the keep as a city. 
Um, so I, I kind of take a different interpretation of the keep on the borderlands than what's presented in the module. The module's like, oh, it's this little town that's beset on all sides by force of chaos. It doesn't really, whenever you kind of read between the lines, it feels like it's more of an outpost expanding outward. And so that's how I interpreted it. And then I just took it 200 years later and and here we are. So the raves are commemorating the events of that original module. In a lot of ways, it feels alive. It feels like the whole city is alive. And the vibe that I get from it was, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Fringe Festival in Edinburgh, Scotland, where it's all arts and culture. And it's a celebration of that that runs up the whole like part of the town, uh, up and down the Royal Mile. And like, and in the areas surrounding it, like where you can't throw a rock without hitting a bar or a pub or a venue where an event is happening or like um, street artists and people busking and people who are like, you know, doing performative art, like all over the place. So everywhere where you go in and out of the streets, there is something happening and there is the whole town is alive. And that's pretty much what I get from reading through this module and all the different pubs and just, you know, seeing the way that the town is laid out. And I'm not surprised that they they gentrified the uh, the caverns of chaos because <laughs> why wouldn't they? Is there is there some some commentary on the uh, the broader state of the uh, the industry there? I'll, I'll let that kind of for the for the reader to interpret exactly <laughs> um, if there's if there's a broader commentary or even you know to the extent it deals with themes like you know colonization and, and racism and stuff. Those themes are absolutely there. You're able to play it up or down as much as you want, but it it's it's hard to hide that that is part of what's going on in the module. Um, the goblins are, are clearly disaffected. Um, there's a, a kind of a running joke almost that the dwarves are racist. Um, I think that started in either Gus L's bar or, or Zedek's bar. But um, <laughs> anytime we were like, yeah, these these, these wharf workers, they they hate the lizard folk. They hate the, the kobolds. Um, <laughs> is, uh, speaking of the festival, the, I was wondering if uh, Power Behind the Throne, the, uh, the part of the 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 Warhammer campaign was any influence because it just has that that same like John said that that idea of like 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 a fa- medieval style festival going on uh, as the backdrop for other uh, stories. If it was an influence, it's an un, uh, you know it would be an unconscious one because I'm not familiar with that. Um, oh, I would right say on. that yeah, one piece of media where there was like a festival that very early on I was like oh I like whenever something begins in a festival is like Chrono Trigger the very kind of oh, first yeah, yeah, yeah. cool thing and there's like a millennial. Millennium Fair, I think it's called, um, you know, well, it's more of a carnival type festival, but I always like festivals and fairs. And a lot of times whenever I'm running my games and they go into a city, you know, because in middle in the Middle Ages in a certain period of it, um, there were way more festivals and holidays than certainly we have now. Um, and it's it's fun to enter the city and it's like, oh, yeah, they're in the, the middle of of this festival commemorating, you know, some crazy event that happened years ago. But now that's mostly an excuse to to drink and party and get rowdy. It happens twice in that campaign. It starts in, a, in like, like like two of the three chapters that are really good from the eighties uh, involve uh, a town wide festival, which is really interesting. They knew what they were doing. Another one that uh, I thought of uh, that is also uh, characterized as a pub crawl campaign is uh, Griffin Mountain, where you go to a lot of uh, basically it's like a wilderness, but there's all these roadhouses that you can stop at. But this is a lot tighter and and funnier. This is so much funnier. Uh, there's just so many like all of the bars are very um referential to other things in a way that I feel like 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 a lot of D and D wanted to do this with their like the Dragon Magazine, April Fools magazines uh issues, uh and like something like Castle Greyhawk. Official D D has always struggled with humor, but this this seems very humorous throughout, lighthearted. There's a in, in an effortless way. Are 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 you a funny guy? Is that uh like 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 <laughs> This, was that was that a design concern or did that come out naturally I, I would say to the extent that it is funny maybe that's my natural voice um because I, I do tend to run kind of comedic campaigns I think everybody tends to run comedic campaigns which is why generally the advice with that writing something is keep it you know play it straight it'll it'll be funny at the table and mm-hmm. you know no matter how straight you write it which is why it's kind of a tightrope to add humor at all to modules because you don't want it to be just so ridiculous that when it's actually ran at the table that it's like, oh, this doesn't even hold together. Um, so I kind of had to walk a tightrope of keeping it grounded, keeping it feeling like a cohesive place that is actually happening. But at the same time, it just is so kind of, they're ridiculous kind of situations that make sense in the context of it. But it's like, oh, the, you know, the cultists are playing ping pong underneath the um, the speakeasy that's also the temple of the cult. 
Um, just like small things like that. And it's like, it doesn't detract from it, but it also just kind of gives something for the GM to bounce off of. And when we did dip play tests, all of those, they hit the right note of, you know, each one was, was fun to watch. It was funny. Um, but it wasn't like the module was trying to outshine the humor at the table. It was supplementing what the GM and the players were putting out. It's like, it's like put, putting out like the materials for you to make your jokes with. Right. Yeah. And one question that I have for you is, uh, when you were playtesting this, when you're running this, you know, this is a system neutral adventure. So, dear listener, you can use any system to run this game. Uh, you know, and if you are a 5e person, a Pathfinder person, an OSE person, you could absolutely do it. Uh, but in the actual module, it says you recommend Errant and Karn. Which system were you using when you were playtesting this game throughout? So we used Karn, and, and the reason being, Errant, I think, is a better kind of more fuller game if you want to run a long running campaign. But Cairn and the, the kind of the into the odd family, that that's my go-to for one shots. Um, they're just, they're simple to pick up. Um, they don't have a ton of progression like some other systems do like Aaron might, um, but you don't need progressions if you're only going to run like three sessions. And so for our play test, um, I didn't actually run them. So I, I observed like half of them, um, the Jwiz, the blogger at A Night at Opera, um, ran them for a few friends and for a few friends of his. Um, and I kind of just observed in a lab coat taking, you know, copious notes. They use Karen. So this is like totally tangential, but I love the paper that you printed this uh, zine on. It's just most stuff is smooth. This has like a, a, a toothy kind of watercolor paper. I love zines because they're tactile and I, I usually don't get into like, like what kind of paper stock did you use? Like, like we're an American psycho uh, comparing business cards, but, but what kind of paper stock did you use? Because this is really nice. And it, it, it adds to my reading experience in a way that uh, I needed to call out. So LFOSR is the one who, who printed this first run. And I, I agree. It's super nice, especially not just the paper quality of both the interior and exterior papers, but also like a, the um, sewn binding. Uh, yeah. I, for, for a zine, which, you know, you usually associate with kind of, um, you know, punk kind of low quality. This is like high effort, high energy kind of zine. Um, and that definitely shows in terms of what weight the paper is. Um, I'd have to ask Elif. I, I, I remember whenever I made the initial order back in, what, December or November of last year, we talked about the paper quality, but it's been about a year. Yeah. The last time I talked paperweights. There's something you... about the way that it has the texture. It it makes the art shine too in, in a way that, that I appreciate. And yeah, we use zine as 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 this catch-all phrase, but these are really like chat books or 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 like you know booklets. Like this is this is a finely printed product. And mine, uh and again, I don't know if this was because of the, the Kickstarter or whatnot, but mine came with a bookmark, uh, which has two things on it. It has drink recipes. And it has the barkeep on the Borderlands drinking game, which uh, is thematically appropriate. Did you play test the uh, the the drinking game? Uh, we did not play test the drinking game. Um, I, I want to. It's on my list. Um, so now that it's won an award, it's it's like uh, it's socially acceptable. If my family's like, oh, so you write games that you know, whereas previously they knew it was like a hobby of mine, but they're like, now we're interested. So they they want me to run it for them. Uh, for like the holidays. So I might try with my family and test the drinking rules on them. Uh, my, my my groups have been remote since COVID, but, and I really think that for a drinking game, you can't do it over Zoom. You got to do that in person. Yeah. You know, or, for real. Um, but yeah, we, we took some care with writing at least the, the drinking game. There's even kind of some pseudo sort of safety tools there at the, the end, which is hard to fit on a small bookmark, but we did it. Yeah. Is the is a safety tool a uh, scannable code for Uber so they come pick you up? Or? <laughs> it, it talks about getting rides. It talks about you know eat some carbs. Don't don't pressure anybody to drink. Just kind of like the standard stuff that I think right. that most people are aware of. But like if you're you know uh, eighteen or sorry if you're twenty one of legal drinking age but just beginning to drink, maybe you're not aware of these kind of like best practices for drinking. And then you have some really delicious looking drinks. I really love the pun of gin fizz, uh, spelled D J I N N. Uh, again, it <laughs> the look on Hambone's face is just like this is amazing because it is. This is great. It 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 shows a real love, but uh, like a reasonability to the the whole culture of drinking, which I appreciate. Yeah, the cocktails were a lot of fun to write, and also th those were tested. Um, they went through a couple iterations. The first ones were were quite awful. Um, so. <laughs> So the ones that got got actually like made and, and printed, those are are simpler. Um, I think they have some like some fancy ingredients, but they're basically just plays on some tried and true cocktails. 
Um, there's actually, there was one YouTube uh, video that they made one of the cocktails on the, on the bookmark. Um, but they like switched out almost every ingredient for some like similar thing. And they're like, not great. I'm like, well, it's kind of a different cocktail at that point, but <laughs> yeah. thanks for, <laughs> thanks for trying. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the ship of Theseus at that point, you know? Right. <laughs> exactly. Well, dude, thank you so much for coming on today and talking about Barkeep on the Borderland. Uh, where can people find it on the internet? Like if they want to order a copy, where do they get it? So the best place to go is prismaticwasteland.com. Um, it has a little shop now, so you can buy Barkeep and, you know, the bookmark, coasters, all the various accessories you want from there. Um, it also has my my blog, um, which is kind of the, the driving engine of my creativity. I'm on Twitter is at Prismatic Wastes. I'm at most Twitter alternatives um, at Prismatic <laughs> Wasteland. Um, Prismatic Wasteland is mostly my handle at most places if you need to get in touch with me. And yeah, that, that, the best place is the website. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We recommend everyone go check out Barkeep on the Borderland. It's awesome. Like, if you could hear it in my voice, I'm smiling into the microphone. This is a pretty <laughs> cool thing. It's something that's going to, I think, really bring your table alive a little bit. And it's going to be a nice little sidestep for the normal hack and slash that you may be used to. So this is another amazing episode of the Vintage RPG Podcast. Stu, where can people find you on the internet? They can find me. On Instagram at Vintage RPG, I have already written the Barkeep on the Borderlands entry for the year 2024. I don't remember what month it's in, but it is written. So you can look forward to that next year. Yeah, it's funny because at this point of the year, it's September. So <laughs> We're you are, close. You are so close to starting 2025's post, which is pretty neat as well. <laughs> uh, you can find me across the internet at John McGuire RPG. I'm on the Instagram. I'm on the Twitter for now. I'm on Blue Sky sure uh tiktok i'm promoting more because i have something to promote right now on any of my social media channels or avenues or whatever they're called there's a link that will take you to kickstarter where you can get notified for the hotel exorcist this is the next adventure coming just in time for spooky season from three to an action games the hotel exorcist check in for the thrills Stay for the chills. It's going to be a pretty fun one. Get notified of launch Friday, October 13th on Kickstarter. If you like the show, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Your reviews, they really help other listeners to find us. And if you really like the show, why not become a patron? Patreon.com slash Vintage RPG. It's a pretty cool thing we got going on over there for as little as a dollar a month. You get episodes before anyone else does. You get them at some point on Friday. We keep it vague because we record them week by week and sometimes we record them later in the week but you will get them at some point on friday maybe saturday morning depends but we're just two guys we're just two guys and alex and alex uh, who is wonderful and he's he's somewhere out there in the ether editing these shows together uh you get early episodes you get a behind the scenes look at Stu's book which is called monsters aliens and holes in the ground a guide to tabletop role-playing games from dungeons and dragons to mothership I like that you're landing that plane now all the way. I, that I was that was really it. good. I I I thought last night was good, but this one was wow. I yeah. I'm shocked that that was me. Good stuff. Good stuff. It used to be called experience points, and that was easier. That was yeah, right <laughs> over the play. And it took me a long time to come around to the other name because in my brain, <laughs> which is mostly pudding on many days, it was really settled in there. It it, it hardened like magic shell, if you will. <laughs> uh, but we got a behind the scenes look at three to an action and stuff that I'm putting out with that. We have a killer discord community that you, we'd love for you to be a part of at the three dollar tier. Uh, I run a game every month. Uh, I don't know what I'm running this month, but I am running the second part of my aliens adventure and something else at the ten dollar tier. Stu's got an ongoing West Marches campaign. Patreon.com slash vintage RBG. So for Stu Horvath, I'm John Hambone McGuire. May the dice always roll in your favor. Take care. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Every review helps other listeners to find us. The Vintage RPG Podcast is a ham-fisted production. Music by Dega West. Art by Schaefer Brown. If you like the podcast, you should also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. <laughs>